Thank you very much, Lina, for your kind introduction and uh, thanks to EMAS for keeping up uh, with this uh, continued initiative dedicated to education and, uh, and uh, research. So my theme today will be to discuss about uh, troubles uh, uh, in the area of urinary incontinence and pelvic floor dysfunction in women. Um, it's, a, it's a very uh, timely topic that deserves uh, to be discussed. So let me just uh, uh, pause for a second to remind you what Lina just said. Uh, uh, EMAS is organizing a virtual EMAS school on late parenthood on uh, June 17 and 18. So please, uh, please join the school. It's, a, it's going to be a very exciting program. I'd like also to start uh, with a few introductory slides, which have nothing to do with the theme of the, uh, uh, of the chat today, uh, but I think it is needed because uh, they're needed because we, we kind of miss a little bit our interaction. So uh, while in Congresses we meet and discuss about uh, interpersonal things, we tend to miss a little bit this area. So this is my city, the city where I work, Pisa. It's a wonderful city in the middle, actually on the coast of Tuscany. This is the famous Leaning Tower and uh, uh, the red uh, Pisan flag. That's the city where I work, but this is a city where I live. Uh, name is Luca. It's about 25 kilometers uh, from, uh, from Pisa. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, medieval city uh, surrounded by huge walls. So you can walk on the walls. Uh, there's a beautiful tower with trees on its uh, top, a beautiful river uh, on the side. So I really think that uh, whenever uh, you have the chance to visit Tuscany, spend a day or two, one in Pisa and one in Lucca. And that's my family and uh, the place where I live. You also see my dogs, uh, Bruto and Olivia, up there. And that small uh, uh, um, village uh, on, on this rock uh, is uh, called Nozzano Castello. That's, that's the place where I live. I just stay there. So it's a, it's a, it's a nice place, the, the area where I live. So just to introduce and to have a small uh, flair of interpersonal touch, uh, uh, even if we are connected through a screen. So let me move to uh, science and uh, clinical uh, implications. So menopausal transition is a, a, a very long phase with uh, a lot of different uh, consequences uh, uh, in terms of uh, personal health uh, uh, for women. Um, between the many uh, problems, uh, there is a urogenital atrophy. This you can see on the, on the left of the screen. Uh, it's one of the areas that we have learned uh, is uh, 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 part of the things that change around the time of menopause. And it's actually very relevant because it impairs uh, uh, not just uh, in, uh, in the transition, but over the long range, uh, so in the uh, following years, uh, the health and the quality of life of many women. However, when we discuss about urogenital health, as gynecologists, we are more used to uh, think about uh, uh, vulvovaginal atrophy and uh, vaginal dryness uh, and uh, vaginal pain, uh, things that, uh, um, for, for which we have a lot of uh, therapeutic concepts. Uh, we are a little bit less used to this, to think about the uh, pelvic floor and the bladder function, uh, urinary incontinence as parts of this change. However, it's uh, uh, since a long time that uh, pelvic floor disorders uh, have been recognized by the major scientific societies uh, to find in the menopausal transition one of the main uh, uh, factors uh, favoring the development and the worsening and progression of uh, uh, their manifestations. So menopause is a risk factor and, uh, and it's really important uh, for the development and uh, uh, the manifestations of pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, so we have two different and parallel uh, factors. Uh, menopause with hormonal changes uh, that accompany menopause, which is the area that is a little bit more near to our course uh, as uh, uh, menopause physicians, uh, and chronological aging, uh, which of course uh, accompanies uh, the changes in all the tissues and organs, also in the pelvic floor and in the lower urinary tract. These together uh, determine uh, what happens to uh, many women after, uh, after menopause and during aging. 
So there's a lot of uh, structural changes of uh, the pelvic floor across uh, the menopausal transition. These are classical uh, lines that uh, uh, recall what changes, uh, not just in the uh, appearance of the tissues, but also in the composition of the tissue. Uh, changes in collagen and uh, um, hyaluronic acid, elastic fibers, uh, thickness and vascularization of the epithelia in the internal, in, in the vagina, in the mucosa, but also outside in the vulva. Uh, the connective tissue in the introitus of the, uh, in, in, uh, of the vagina and also the changes uh, in the external genitalia are not limited to the labia, to the introitus, to the hymen, but also to the urethral meatus. This is something that is visible very often and very often women develop uh, uh, an, uh, an extra flexion of the internal mucosa of the urethra that can be visible and sometimes can bleed, uh, um, actually causing alarm and uh, the diagnostic uh, 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 efforts in tr trying to differentiate whether it's a, it's a vaginal or a genital bleeding. Uh, so everything changes, but it doesn't change just uh, in the appearance of the mucosa, in the pH, in the lubrication. It also changes in the connective tissue, elastic fibers. So in everything that has to do with the pelvic floor stability and function. So this is uh, one of the reasons uh, why a few years ago now, the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health and, and NAMS, the North American Menopause Society, jointly uh, proposed uh, this uh, new terminology of genital urinary syndrome of the menopause uh, to recall, to, to uh, underline the fact that uh, uh, menopause is not just about the vagina, it's also about the lower urinary tract. And uh, this definition is actually uh, limited in, in that uh, there's a lot of things, including bladder function, uh, pelvic floor stability, bowel function, that are not actually in, uh, uh, enclosed in this broader definition. But this definition has had the merit of uh, making that first step forward into uh, uh, indicating to the clinicians that there's something more than the vagina that changes because uh, of uh, menopause or facilitated by menopause. Um, so uh, this is one of the review that I cite most. Uh, it uh, dates a few years now. It was uh, published in the American Journal of uh, OBGYN. And you can see that uh, between the signs and symptoms of the GSM, you have a lot of urological signs and symptoms. Uh, frequency, urgency, post-void dribbling, uh, nocturia, stress or urgency, incontinence, dysuria, loss of blood with urine, so hematuria, recurrent urinary tract infections. All these are symptoms that we encounter a lot in uh, early postmenopausal women. And they're actually very often the clinical problem. So it's, it's for us more difficult to approach uh, um, uh, an urgency frequency syndrome or nocturia or recurrent urinary tract infection as compared to what we can do with the therapeutical concepts that we are uh, uh, used to manage, uh, uh, for instance, to address the dyspareunia because of uh, uh, vulvovaginal atrophy. So this is a big chapter uh, for which we need to realize that the symptoms are very often underreported, the signs are very often underrecognized, and for sure, there's a lot of undertreatment. So this is something that is very similar to uh, vaginal atrophy uh, 15 to 20 years ago. So the, these types of concepts, uh, it's not reported. Women don't tell about that uh, and we don't propose or we don't ask about that. So those were the discussions we had at the time. It does still apply to the urogenital uh, part. So let me move uh, through a set of slides to uh, try and recall and point out uh, what are the things uh, that are uh, relevant uh, for us to, to, to take into consideration. Uh, atrophy of the urinary tract, is it the same uh, of the atrophy of the vagina? So it's, it's, it's in some ways, yes, in some ways it doesn't uh, look exactly the same. Symptoms that are very common are dysuria, uh, urethral syndrome, so having pain or discomfort when urinating. Trigonitis, cystitis, so uh, inflammatory uh, slash uh, infective uh, conditions. Uh, 
uh, that are uh, very important and can be recurrent. Uh, and incontinence, SUI stands for stress urinary incontinence and overactive bladder is the uh, clinical, uh, uh, the pathophysiological background for uh, urge urinary incontinence. So whenever the, the bladder wants to empty uh, with urgency and therefore uh, uh, urges the patient to find the bathroom as soon as possible. So these are very uh, frequent uh, and common complaints in uh, postmenopausal women. And pain, pain is the other uh, side of the coin. Uh, pain is very often associated to inflammatory uh, um, um, conditions of the bladder. Bladder pain is very often in postmenopausal women a problem that is the uh, origin of a, a broader painful uh, uh, syndrome that can actually uh, lead uh, to chronic pelvic pain. And pain can be, uh, uh, can emerge uh, uh, from many different entries. Uh, one can be the recurrency of a urinary tract infection. So if you have a lot of infections uh, and you start having your bladder uh, irritated uh, every two weeks, uh, uh, your bladder will become painful, a, a painful bladder. And uh, having a chronic uh, painful bladder uh, also makes uh, sex uh, uh, painful. And very often you develop then postcoital uh, bladder pain, uh, urgency syndrome, uh, and uh, the need to use antibiotics and painkillers uh, for uh, specifically targeting the bladder. So this is a, a chain that very often uh, uh, synergizes uh, with the full vaginal atrophy because uh, as we all know atrophy of the vagina favors uh, the development of infections and of course favors uh, the development of pain at intercourse and therefore bladder pain after intercourse. And of course this also influences uh, uh, sexual function because uh, in any of the domains uh, of uh, classical four domains of sexual function, desire, arousal, orgasmic function and uh, pain, uh, you can find reasons which are under brackets, uh, I won't read uh, through the all single motivations, uh, for which having a prolapse or having a urinary incontinence uh, makes uh, sexual function worse. Desire is uh, impaired because of anxia, because of fear of leaking urine during intercourse, arousal because of tension, uh, orgasmic function can be uh, a lot impaired by the uh, fact that uh, very often women with prolapse or with urinary incontinence tend to have a lot of tension in the uh, pelvic floor muscles uh, in order than trying, uh, avoiding uh, losing urine and of course pain uh, depending on the condition you have in the background. So there is a, there is a uh, direction in which uh, atrophic changes in the vulva and the vagina, along with the uh, changes in the microbiome in the lower vaginal and urinary tract, uh, and changes in the bladder and the urethra, all synergize. And that's uh, what uh, really GSM should stand for, to remind us of this connection. And uh, to this extent, uh, it's very interesting to uh, uh, underline that uh, we have some concepts uh, clear how the loss of estrogen uh, affects, uh, for instance, the vaginal uh, function after the menopause. We do also have a lot of indication on how estrogens uh, turn into modification of uh, bladder function and urethral function. But there are uh, areas that are not covered yet by a significant amount of research for which uh, there is an open path for the future years. Uh, for instance, what is the role of androgens, uh, which we do know have uh, uh, important uh, um, uh, functions in the genesis of uh, uh, low libido or uh, impaired sexual function across menopause or uh, in sarcopenia or in uh, bone loss. Uh, but uh, there's also uh, a very strong possibility that uh, the amount of androgens that are left over in the circulation of a woman at the time of a personal specific menopause uh, may also be very important in determining the function of the, the bladder muscles, uh, the sphincters, uh, the vascularization of the urethra. So it may not just be estrogens, but it might also be androgens. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a field for research, as I said. So lots of things change. 
One of the things that also changes, which we are just starting to understand, is the eurobiome. So the, the amount and the type of bacterial species that colonize the urinary tract. We have a lot of information of, uh, uh, on how the bacteria in the vagina change over the menopausal transition and how the uh, replacement uh, of estrogens can actually revert or uh, modify some of these bacterial changes. Uh, it's less uh, understood what happens in the bladder, but there is, a, as you can see in this graph, there is a lot of overlap uh, between bacteria that colonize the vagina and uh, the lower urinary, uh, urinary tract. So it's, it's well expected that uh, uh, since there's so many estrogen withdrawal dependent changes in the vagina in terms of bacterial population, there might be uh, similar changes also in the eurobiome, so in the bladder. So to this extent, uh, if uh, uh, the effects uh, of uh, hormonal uh, readministration in the vagina has uh, nowadays, uh, uh, to some extent, predictable results in terms of uh, vaginal colonization, uh, uh, we don't really know uh, whether this is going to be the same uh, in the urinary tract. So this is also field for future research. However, what is clear is that uh, the type of bacteria that colonize uh, the bladder are associated with urinary tract symptoms. So in this study, uh, published in 2016, you can see that there's a lot of bacteria uh, listed uh, uh, in the X, uh, axis of the, of the graph. And you see the association between the presence of these uh, bacteria and the uh, uh, presence of lower urinary tract symptoms. Uh, uh, for instance, urgency symptoms, painful symptoms, uh, frequency, things like this. So you can see that uh, for at least a couple of bacteria, Staphylococci and uh, Gardnerella, there's a clear association. So if you have those bacteria, you have more or less symptoms uh, 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 that are associated with the lower urinary tract. So there is a possibility that the type of urinary colonization uh, may also be relevant uh, for the development of lower urinary tract symptoms. So not just having uh, an infection, a bacterial infection, a cystitis, uh, but the um, uh, colonization, uh, the lower uh, amount of bacteria that are always there. And uh, on the other side, uh, there is an aging process uh, in the lower urinary tract. Uh, so, uh, which you, you see a brain and a bladder because uh, there's a lot of aging that is also nerve aging and central control of the bladder uh, that changes with time. So the concept here is that the bladder across aging, so during the 30 years after menopause, uh, undergoes a lot of changes. There is a loss of muscle fibers, uh, particularly in the sphincters, in the uh, urethral sphincters, uh, which is very important in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the, the likelihood of developing uh, incontinence. There's a lot of changes in the central nervous system and spinal control of the bladder, which uh, has a lot of implication for the sensitivity of the bladder. So uh, bladder capacity, so how much urine the bladder can store before the patient, uh, the woman, sorry, uh, feels the need to urinate. Uh, the ability to uh, drive the contraction of the bladder, so how easy and complete uh, is voiding the emptying of the bladder. And also uh, the ability to uh, 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 repress, uh, to suppress uh, contractions of the bladder, uh, the trousal muscles, so the, the, the muscle of the bladder, that drive the need to rush to the bathroom. So that those changes that lead to uh, urge uh, urinary incontinence. There's a lot of inflammatory changes and oxidative stress and ischemia as well. So the changes in the vessel go along with oxidative stress and inflammation to uh, determine bladders that become less efficient in contracting, they become uh, uh, progressively more rigid, uh, they become less sensitive uh, to uh, being filled up with urine and less efficient uh, in determining when and when, uh, when, when there is a need uh, to empty the bladder and when there should not be any contraction because it's not a time to empty the bladder. So there is a, an inherent worsening in the uh, bladder function throughout uh, the, these uh, uh, postmenopausal years. 
that in to some extent you see in this very complex graph where some of these pathophysiological mechanisms uh, are recalled uh, vascular dysfunction, ischemia, inflammatory cytokines, muscles, vasculature, whatever. So don't look at the graph, but look on the left side of the graph. You see that menopause and uh, in general, those women that have a genital urinary syndrome of the menopause uh, tend to have more neurogenic inflammation of the bladder. So it's, uh, there is a recognized contribution of menopause to this aging process in the bladder. Very important. So, uh, and again, uh, the inherent and very important connection between the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system and the bladder, because the bladder is very, uh, a lot, uh, the, the, it, the, it, it has a lot of very tight control centers in uh, the uh, spine, uh, where there is a, a big nucleus, the onus nucleus, uh, the onus nucleus that uh, controls uh, um, 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 peripheral uh, uh, reflex arcs uh, that uh, make the bladder uh, feeling being associated with uh, relaxing uh, uh, inputs uh, from uh, the periphery directly, which allows the bladder to be filled up up to a certain level without uh, 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 enticing without uh, uh, stimulating the, the need to urinate, and the central nervous system as well, uh, which uh, which of course uh, controls uh, bladder pain and uh, can be very important in the chronic chronicization of the bladder dysfunction and pain. So a lot of very complex uh, interactions that in part can also be inter, uh, you know modified by. Uh, by estrogen loss uh, uh, at the time of menopause and possibly, as I said, also by androgen deprivation. So between the, dis the main dysfunction in the blood, the three main areas uh, that are interesting uh, uh, over aging uh, is the reduction of bladder capacity. So bladder that becomes more rigid, so it cannot be filled up with the urine as uh, it was able to do before. So it starts to need, uh, uh, to require being emptied uh, uh, after a shorter time frame. So the truth of overactivity, which is uh, what drives uh, um, uh, urge urinary incontinence uh, and uh, or symptoms of overactivity, so the need, the painful or urgent need to go and urinate. And uh, very important, particularly in the aging population, the impairment of bladder emptying. So when the strength of the muscle uh, is not sufficient to allow a complete emptying of the bladder, which uh, of course uh, facilitates infections and uh, bladder um, uh, reflux uh, uh, towards the, the ureters uh, with the risk of uh, um, uh, upwards infections. The urethra, what are the changes in the urethra? This is very interesting and it's been known for a, a, probably a longer time. The epithelium teens, there is a loss of uh, vascular flow and pulsatile activity around the urethra, which makes a lot of the uh, urethral closure pressure, as it is called in uh, urodynamic terms. Uh, there's a slowing of nerve condition time uh, and uh, conduction time, and there's a lot of uh, uh, collagen tissue and elastic tissue in the Support of the urethra. So it's much easier to develop a stress uh, urinary incontinence uh, uh, because of these changes altogether. And um, so, again, going to the clinical setting, uh, what uh, a woman across the menopausal transition and in the years thereafter might uh, ask us. Uh, in terms of consultation is uh, having genital discomfort, uh, dyspareunia associated with uh, urinary incontinence, nocturia, need, so the need to wake up and go to the bathroom more frequently, urgency and frequency, voiding symptoms, recurrent urinary tract infection and painful bladder and painful urethra. Um, so this is again a graph uh, from, from Ian Milsom um, um, a long time ago now, 2006, uh, in prevalence of a type of incontinence and age. And you can see that across all ages, uh, one can find stress and urge urinary incontinence or the combination of the two. But stress urinary incontinence is really something that develops across uh, uh, 
uh, the, uh, in, in the younger woman across the, the age of the menopausal transition, early urinary incontinence becomes uh, uh, very important uh, along with mixed urinary incontinence uh, across the, 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 the years thereafter because it's more associated with those neuroinflammatory changes in the bladder and with the frequency of inflammation. And again, if you look at the number of urinary tract infections in postmenopausal women, you do see that there's a clear increase in females, which is the black uh, bars, um, uh, after the age of uh, the menopausal transition. So starting from uh, 49 and on, uh, there's a clear increase in the frequency of, the, of uh, infections uh, with a peak uh, over the age of 80, which is of course a little bit less uh, associated with infective events per se, but it's more associated with uh, um, uh, immobilization and, and, uh, and uh, chronic uh, um, uh, inability of patients to move and the need to use uh, uh, pads and things like that. But it's clear that there's a raise in inflammation in, in, in infective events. And this is very important because uh, having an, an infection in the bladder it's not just having the acute cystitis, uh, which uh, can bring symptoms. And actually, uh, after the menopause, uh, 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 it's much more common not to have a, a very strong cystitis with uh, uh, burning pain uh, during urination, but rather having chronic uh, uh, bladder pain, uh, painful intercourses, and uh, urgency symptoms, which are very common. And that is because uh, the amount of bacteria, particularly if they're E. coli, so those type of bacteria that colonize the bladder most often, uh, particularly after the menopause, uh, they do stimulate uh, a sensitive receptor, toll-like receptor 4, for instance, are particularly important, that do connect the epithelium of the bladder, so the urothelium, with the uh, uh, um, uh, sensory neurons uh, uh, beneath uh, the bladder that do stimulate uh, the sacral spine, the, 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 the spine uh, and the, the, the reflex arcs uh, into uh, uh, signaling that there's pain, that there's inflammation and therefore receiving back uh, uh, stimuli that drive uh, bladder contraction. Okay, so inflammation drives pain and contraction, which means urgency symptoms and the need to urinate more often. Uh, so that's why some women, because of uh, increased colonization of the lower urinary tract, uh, have uh, more frequent, uh, continuous, uh, annoying, uh, urgency symptoms, uh, painful bladder frequency, nocturia symptoms, uh, which very often do not qualify for the typical woman with uh, urge urinary incontinence. So a lot of women have a low level disturbance uh, in, in these terms. So they don't lose urine, they don't need to rush to the bathroom, but they have this increased, continuously annoying need and feeling of an inflamed bladder, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, 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 very important in the determining a uh, decrease in quality of life. And there's a lot of overlap with other symptoms and other conditions. And uh, for instance, uh, just to start with, with the genital urinary syndrome of the menopause. So it's sometimes difficult to uh, dissect uh, what are the symptoms of uh, an atrophic vagina with vaginal dryness uh, and uh, burning symptoms associated to that uh, uh, as compared to uh, uh, an inflamed uh, uh, bladder due to uh, inflammatory or neuroinflammatory changes. Uh, so th this is very interesting. So sometimes uh, there's a lot of things that may justify the same symptoms. So we need to be able to navigate uh, and, to, and to do the correct uh, assessment uh, and uh, turning the discussion into the how approaching therapeutically the, the patient, because that's really what the patient wants, not a diagnosis, but rather a treatment, uh, then how to manage uh, having in mind that there may be different things to be treated uh, at the same time, uh, hormonal or uh, bladder uh, modifications. So uh, when we discuss about the therapeutic approach of GSM, particularly in view of the lower urinary tract symptoms, which is really what I want to discuss today, 
that's always a very uh, difficult equilibrium because sometimes, uh, as, as we have said uh, uh, right now, there's not just one cause and one consequence. It's a mix of things. And some of the things are really tricky. And uh, every, if you change those things, which are minor, probably contributors uh, to the same to the set of symptoms that the patient has uh, you will not immediately drive uh, uh, a positive change in, in, in terms of symptoms uh, but if you don't address that, that minor contributor you probably are not going to be successful in the midterm. So it's very difficult because what we need to do is to try and restore urogenital physiology, which is a big uh, concept and not uh, necessarily something doable. But uh, having that as a you know, theoretical and ideal uh, uh, aim, uh, we have a lot of things that we may want to use. And, and there's a, a little bit of disconnection here because some of the therapeutical concepts are typically used by gynecologists. Some of the therapeutical concepts, which are more for the bladder uh, part, are more used by the urologists or urogynecologists. And even the urogynecologists are not uh, um, necessarily experts in hormonal treatment. Uh, so uh, it, it's a kind of a, uh, you know, a territory in between, uh, uh, you know, areas where there are certainties, uh, but uh, these are uh, territory in between needs to be explored by the inhabitants of the two big cities, uh, which, uh, you know, which neighbor this, uh, this territory. Uh, of course, it's, it's not necessarily like that. So I'm sure that within the audience, that will be, uh, you know, uh, persons who are perfectly confident in using all these therapeutic concepts. But in my personal experience, I see uh, this uh, missing in some of the colleagues that I interact with. Uh, so, of course, using estrogens uh, uh, as a concept is very important in, uh, the, in the context of a woman having low urinary tract symptoms uh, uh, and uh, uh, a GSM. Uh, there's also newer concepts like uh, DHEA, vaginal DHEA, the use of androgens uh, in general terms, uh, uh, the associations of uh, uh, selective estrogen receptor modulators with estrogens or, or the use of selective estrogen receptor modulators that target directly the lower urinary tract. And uh, there's uh, you know, some emerging evidence that uh, these two treatments are also, also the newer one, particularly ospemifen may, may be uh, important also for the lower urinary tract uh, symptoms. The, it's, it's very important to be able to master also the use of lubricants and moisturizers in order to make less traumatic uh, sexual activity if needed. Probiotic, uh, hyaluronic acid, demon nose, these are concepts that are very important in trying to maintain a good uh, uh, bladder health in favoring the presence of good uh, bacteria and uh, antagonizing the colonization by uh, bowel bacteria, particularly by E. coli, coliformic uh, bacteria. And, and every other thing, also uh, uh, energies like laser therapies might be very important, although we do know the role in the vagina, we do not really know the role uh, of uh, energies in uh, the lower urinary tract. And of course, all the treatments for bladder dysfunction, and I'm just quoting because they're most known to the audience, I'm sure, uh, anti-muscarinic therapies, which are those treatments that we use to relax the bladder for patients uh, with uh, urgent urinary incontinence or uh, urgency frequency symptoms or bladder pain as well. So to this extent, we have information, we have some evidence. Uh, There's a Cochrane uh, review a few years ago uh, that uh, shows that uh, estrogen therapy in uh, view of urinary incontinence complaints in postmenopausal women uh, can have a role in uh, uh, keeping the collagen there, which uh, is associated with the good urethral closure function and the true smooth muscle function. Uh, it could uh, be important in reversing somatrophic uh, bladder changes, particularly in terms, as we have said, of uh, urothelial damage and inflammation reversal. And it can be synergistic with anti-muscarinic treatment. So if you have a woman with uh, vulvovaginal atrophy and uh, um, uh, overactive bladder, you can use altogether estrogens uh, uh, and uh, anti-muscarinic agents or other uh, blood relaxing agents. Uh, so this is something doable for which there is uh, some evidence uh, there. 
um, uh, there is also a clinical improvement in urgency, direct effect on lower urinary tract uh, uh, because of direct effects on the lower urinary tract or because uh, uh, changes in the VVA, which also modifies the sensitivity, the feeling of the bladder by the woman. Uh, and this synergism is because of many reasons. One of the main reasons is because of the known ability of local estrogens, uh, so vaginal estrogens, uh, in uh, decreasing the number of vaginal, uh, of the urinary tract infections, because of decreasing the colonization by coliform uh, uh, bacteria in uh, by E. coli in the vagina, so decreasing the uh, infections of the bladder. There's also a lot of promising therapeutical concepts. Uh, this we have listed in, uh, in a review article that we have published with Imas uh, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so new concepts uh, that target specifically the bladder or the urethra, that maybe some of them have uh, hormonal uh, uh, basis, some of them are just uh, receptor targeting uh, agents. Uh, which are very interesting, neurokinin receptor antagonists, uh, which uh, are under development also for vasoactive symptoms, uh, vasomotor symptoms, uh, uh, reuptake inhibitors, uh, which we do use for depression. Uh, so something that is moving in that field and, and some of the therapeutical concepts that are likely to come in the future overlap uh, with some of the applications for which we use them in uh, postmenopausal women. So this is very interesting, I think. So my uh, final key points uh, are that uh, um, GSM is not just GSM, it's GSM plus something that is not really entered into our daily discussion, uh, which is lower urinary tract symptoms. Both aging and menopause affect the uro part of the urogenital tract uh, in postmenopausal women. So we as menopause physicians need to be aware of the changes when they happen because they're not the same in every woman. So there's going to be women that uh, have a strong modification in their bladder function, some who will not uh, experience that uh, problem. So we need to identify those women that need our attention to this extent. Urinary problems in postmenopausal women with GSM are underreported. So we need, uh, as we did uh, for uh, vaginal atrophy, we need to ask. Uh, this is the time to raise and to increase uh, the awareness in the population uh, that these things, these changes are not normal and they should not be just bared and that there's treatments that can be used. And these treatments are more effective if used earlier rather than when a, a woman has a painful bladder that has been, been painful for five years, because at that time point, it's very difficult to revert these changes. And this is because atrophy and chronic inflammation are the basis. And so it's like with the vessels, it's like with atherosclerosis. If, uh, if you want to do something, you have to keep the vessels clean and healthy. If you wait for the vessels to be clogged with atherosclerosis, then you have nothing to do anymore. Uh, and the same is with the bladder. So if you have something that keeps the bladder healthier uh, from the beginning, this is going to be more, more effective. Hormonal therapy, uh, menopausal hormone therapy is the mainstay of medical treatment. Uh, and there's new promising hormonal drugs. So we as gynecologists need to be proactive also with our urologists, uh, colleagues uh, and urogynecologists to, to say that if whenever there's uh, the uh, uh, therapeutic uh, space uh, for a, um, a hormonal treatment, particularly local hormonal treatment uh, in women with lower urinary tract symptoms, uh, one would expect that, that hormones would help and synergize with other treatments. So the key is a personalized approach and a synergistic therapeutic approach uh, using uh, different therapeutic concepts, hormones, uh, uh, probiotics, uh, hyaluronic acid, uh, um, um, and so and so, um, demon nose, uh, cranberry, whatever you want, uh, but you need to put things together and try to make the best mix uh, for every woman. So this is my last slide, but I'd like to uh, follow up uh, saying that uh, we're moving towards better time, we hope. So maybe next time I wouldn't need to show you my, my where I live because we will meet together. There's a lot of, uh, lots of events that are in plan uh, between this uh, next year and a half. The IMS Congress uh, will be in Lisbon. We, we are quite certain that this will be in person. So book the dates. Next year in March, we'll also meet, and this is 
something that for, for many of you might be interesting in Florence uh, for the Ghanaian endocrinology meeting, the ISG Congress, which, which uh, it would be fantastic to, to be again in uh, Florence. And unfortunately, we won't make it to make it in person, uh, but uh, the EMS Congress is also planned for September. So I really hope that this will be our last uh, virtual Congress. We've learned a lot from virtual Congresses, uh, but uh, in-person Congresses are always uh, better. But anyways, uh, this is going to be a special one. So book the dates uh, and, uh, and uh, register for the Congress. So having said that, I'm, I'm done with my presentation and I'm, you know, there may be questions, so I'm, I'm open to questions, right? Thank you, Dr. Simoncini, for such a wonderful presentation. And now for the Q&A, we will wait for a few seconds. I remind you that you can submit your text questions at the questions panel in your webinar dashboard. <clears throat> uh, right. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I didn't, I, I missed you for a second. Uh, was there a, a question? Yes, we have uh, one question. What is the role of oral MHT in GSM or LUTS treatment? Okay, Thank perfect. You. Sorry, yes. sorry, I missed that. Uh, sure, no sure. problem, no problem. Okay, so yes, uh, uh, that is a little bit more contentious. Uh, the reason is uh, the evidence we have uh, comes from uh, big trials uh, that uh, were not specifically aimed uh, at investigating uh, uh, lower urinary tract symptoms or even urinary incontinence or even uh, pelvic organ prolapse. So the, the data that we have uh, uh, comes from big studies, big, also big interventional studies. One of these studies is the Women's Health Initiative trial, where women that were administered hormone menopausal ther uh, hormone therapy were also asked with questionnaires, uh, do you have incontinence? Uh, did you have it before? Do you have it now? So what comes from these studies is that it looks like there's an increased number of, uh, uh, of uh, urinary incontinence events in women receiving hormonal treatments. There, uh, there has also been a study published by, with a Finnish registry uh, which we have actually criticized uh, openly with an editorial, uh, showing that women who were receiving hormone therapy had more urinary incontinence, which is uh, uh, methodologically uh, very, very weak uh, as a study. So the, 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 the right answer is that we really don't know. There's never been a study in women with, say, urinary incontinence, okay, urge or stress urinary incontinence, investigating what is the role of hormonal readministration after the menopause. Clinically speaking, uh, I don't think there, there's any urogynecologist uh, that does this work uh, uh, in his uh, daily practice uh, that has ever seen a woman developing urinary incontinence uh, because of the administration of menopausal hormone therapy. I've never seen one. Uh, so uh, my, my, my expert opinion would be that the menopausal hormone therapy, so if you give estrogens, uh, per mouth, uh, you will not worsen urinary function. Uh, uh, if you will in improve it, uh, I don't think we can give an answer, but there's certainly not a reason why not providing hormonal treatment if needed, uh, uh, because uh, some studies have reported, uh, I'm sorry, I've been very long, but I, I had to, I had to uh, explain. All right, just as a reminder, we're receiving questions in the Q&A icon. The next question is talking about treatments. What about new HIFEM technology? Yes, I, I think with the HIFEM technology, you refer to, to those uh, radio frequency treatments and there's a lot uh, of these uh, applications. Some of them are applied directly in vagina. Some of them are applied with, with uh, type, like uh, on a water closure where the women sit with those uh, uh, there's a round uh, uh, electrode that uh, provides uh, <clears throat> radio frequency uh, stimulation to the to the basic to the pelvic floor. Uh, interesting concepts. Uh, um, uh, there's no data uh, on uh, uh, on urinary incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse. Uh, as I have said, even with laser treatments, which are more advanced in terms of research and development. Uh, I don't feel confident uh, right now to uh, suggest uh, 
uh, laser treatment uh, for uh, urinary incontinence because I don't think that there's enough uh, literature around. So uh, particularly because those treatments are very often uh, available uh, uh, in the private setting. So women are paying for this treatment. So I really think that, uh, you know, everything that, uh, that is offered uh, in the private setting, each, there should be a good reason why women are paying for that treatment. So I don't think that that's there. I think there is a rationale why it should be uh, effective, but I think we need to see it uh, with solid data. Okay, our next question for you, Dr. Simoncini. Can the progestogen used in MHT have negative impact in the urinary symptoms? In urinary symptoms? Yeah, th thank you for the question. Not that I know. Of course, progestogens are, uh, are um, um, if you want that, you know, as you know, are uh, relaxing the, uh, the, the smooth muscles. Um, so they have side effects uh, on, uh, for instance, in some, some very sensitive patients uh, in, uh, on the bowel function, for instance, uh, uh, but not that I know in the bladder. And actually most women tend to have uh, uh, overactive bladders as a, as a problem. So eventually if, uh, if these side effects would be, uh, uh, if affecting the bladder, it, it could be it could be something positive, but uh, the the main answer is not that I know. There's no data around to suggest it. Right, and finally, what is your view on aspemifen? Who should receive it and when? Okay, aspemifen is a very good treatment for uh, vaginal atrophy, uh, and uh, the uh, correct uh, indication is. Uh, treatment of vaginal atrophy in women uh, after the menopause. Uh, you know that in the instruction sheet, at least here in Europe, uh, it's actually something that should be prescribed only to those patients that uh, cannot uh, uh, be treated with uh, vaginal local treatments, so vaginal estrogens, basically, or similar. Uh, but anyways, it, it can be used also in first-line treatment. Uh, there's no specific reason that I understand for this indication. For urinary uh, complaints, uh, uh, there's some preliminary data. There's uh, three, four papers uh, published uh, suggesting that uh, ospemifen administration to women with uh, pulvovaginal atrophy, who also had uh, urge urinary incontinence, uh, tend to have less uh, urge urinary incontinence. So it's like ospemifen uh, uh, may be similar to estrogens uh, to the bladder and uh, able to stimulate uh, uh, a relaxation of the bladder, so to decrease uh, uh, over bladder overactivity. So this is very preliminary. We also have a study ongoing, so we are uh, nearly to the end of the study, and uh, we have also shown some of the preliminary results uh, in a couple of congresses uh, uh, recently. And what we see is that during ospenifen, similar to what we see with estrogen, so it's not a different type of an effect, but uh, the bladder is a little bit less sensitive. So in women that have a, a, an hypersensitive bladder, uh, there's less sensibility and the bladder contracts less. So there might be something there, but I think it's, it's very early to assess that strongly. And it's not a specific indication for the drug right now. Thank you, Dr. Simoncini. Any final thoughts you'd like to share with us before ending today's presentation? Uh, well, I, I think I've said a lot of things, uh, so I hope I wasn't, uh, uh, it wasn't too much. Uh, my, my, uh, so this theme, I'm very grateful to Imas for asking me to cover this theme because it's very near to my heart, uh, because in my daily practice, I, I do a lot of urogynecology, and of course, I'm uh, uh, very fond of menopause uh, uh, practice. Uh, so I really think this is an important field. So if, uh, if those who are listening are not uh, that into uh, the urogynecological complaints, uh, it, it's very rewarding uh, uh, devoting some time into understanding a little bit better how these things uh, uh, emerge because there is a lot of women that uh, do not receive uh, an expert uh, uh, treatment. Uh, and, uh, and it becomes a winning uh, uh, tool in the arms uh, of a physician. Those physicians that are successful are those physicians that uh, uh, provide answers and solutions where other physicians are not able to. 
So particularly if you work in the private setting, uh, but also in the public setting, if you, you know, it's, it's always good to be able to offer solutions that others have not been able to, uh, to, to provide. So this is really worth, uh, uh, you know, devoting some time in uh, personal development. So if, for those who are here, I think it was of interest. Uh, so I hope you liked it uh, and I hope it was uh, of uh, help. This concludes the webinar. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Simoncini, for your presentation and all the attendees for being here today. Have a thank great you so much. Thank you. Have thank a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.